Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Well, Dr. Obadiah Melaifa joins us now. He is an economist. Thank you for coming on this morning, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, the, the matters concerning the last election still, you know, uh, out there, particularly having seen how the dailies are reflecting what transpired yesterday, even yes. though the lawyers are saying, well, we we'll have to wait and see whatever reasons uh, have been adduced before all of those. But how, yes, they talked about the speed yes. with which this was dispensed with. Uh, they talked about uh, what the judges also said at this preliminary stage. But in all, what's your impression of it? Well, I made it a point of driving around Abuja yesterday and I noticed that the mood was very somber almost mournful well um, the judgment wasn't against me because I didn't take anyone to court uh, so I was an observer as a citizen like everybody else uh, but I have reasons to feel um, very concerned as a citizen. Why? I feel that it, has, it is the justice system of our country that has been on trial, not Atiku Abubakar Pase or the PDP or anybody else or the APC. Now look, prior to the elections, you had a situation where the chief justice of the country was maneuvered out. There were issues, but I think that in the end, they pressured him and kind of negotiated a deal he could not refuse. And so he left. Is, is that in public domain that there was a deal negotiated? Well, uh, <laughs> there, there, there must have been. Uh, secondly, just two weeks ago, prior to this case coming up, you know, uh, for judgment, you had um, a new set of judges, I think about this seven of them, being brought on board. Now, the timing is very questionable. I, I, I can reveal that I studied law up to final year at the University of London. It's just that I was not called to the bar and I did not take my final exams because I decided to go into banking. So I'm not entirely ignorant of law or of jurisprudence for that matter. Now, <laughs> we heard some very silly comments such as, well, the Supreme Court is not infallible because it is final or it is not final because it is infallible. This is just a mere place of words. As far as I know, only the Holy Father, the Pope, is infallible. And no human court can be said to be infallible, regardless of its appellate status. So, to me, nobody is infallible. Uh, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable with a judgment of this kind being issued ex cathedra uh, pending when the, the ratio, as lawyers would call it, the ratio for that decision that will come much later. I don't like that. The reasoning should be immediate. The ratio should be upfront even before the final decision is made so that even a schoolboy knows the reasoning and the evidence that led to that decision. Because we're seeing the same pattern with yes. not just this particular case, with some uh, governorship uh, petition cases yes. where the judgment is handed down, then they say, well, we'll come back and explain why. The whole that thing is nonsensical. Later. It's nonsensical. They don't do that in civilized commonwealth countries of the common law. They don't do that. They don't do that in Britain. They don't do that in, in, in the United States. They don't do that in Canada. 
They don't do that in India. They don't do that in all the countries of the civilized Commonwealth but that I'm aware of. is it illegal? It is not illegal, but it is not good form. Because it looks as if you are just some Greek god sitting there and dishing out a ruling. And then later explaining what the what thing is. What is the implication of that? The implication of that is that uh, it makes people to have serious doubts as to the jurisprudential reasoning that has led up to that. It's as if you make a decision and then you go back and cook up the reason why this should be done. I'm very, very disappointed in the whole process. For me, whether it's Atiku or Buhari, to be honest with you, it's neither here nor there. Neither here nor there. For me, it is just that I feel that our institutions are on trial. And look, a situation where the INEC chairman comes from the president's catchment area, geopolitical area, and also ethno-religious background, and the chief justice, actually from the same state with the same uh, background, and he's not even a specialist in the common law. I was not impressed at all. When his hearing came up, he did not reason like a Supreme Court Chief Justice yeah. of the rank of Taslim Elias. Look, I have a right to make this point. Very important. I, I don't think he's competent uh, 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 as a Supreme Court Justice. Seriously. But they have a process. They have the NGC, they have all of those processes. If this were the case, shouldn't they themselves the, have put up a position? have been hijacked by certain vested interests. And so for me, there is the judgment of God, there's the judgment of the people, and there's the judgment of history. I feel that we've been shortchanged very grossly in this process. Mm, there are those who believe that uh, this is one judgment that has gone in favor of the APC, uh, that this question of the credibility of the judiciary is only coming up because the PDP lost, um, and that it has benefited immensely if you look at other levels where it has gone to court. Mm -hmm. uh, it has benefited you know, quite a good deal from the justice system. Is it because of this one case uh, that we would then dismiss the entire integrity of the judiciary? I have never said that I am dismissing the entire integrity of the judiciary. I've never said so. But I have reason to believe that there has been gross political manipulation of the higher judicature. There is tokenism. You, you, you pad a few things here in Zamfara and so on, because they're all crazy anyway over there. There's a lot of things going on, and then you do a few things here and there. But in the really big thing, the, in the really big thing, uh, this is really where we are seeing issues. I'm sorry the quality has gone down. You cannot say this is the Supreme Court uh, that uh, Chukudifu Oputa sat in, or Justice Elias. Come on, man. This this why world giants. We are being we are being being led by Lilliputians. So, in, indeed, from a jurisprudential point of view, why we may while we may question uh, the quality of judges. Mm -hmm that we have yes. um, at the Supreme Court, and this question shouldn't come up today. Yes. Um, what is in question right now is yes. the quality of the judgment that has been passed. Yes. We're yet to know precisely whether this was a unanimous judgment on the part of all seven judges. Yes. Uh, or whether this was uh, a majority judgment. Yes. Uh, but what we have been told is that the Supreme Court yes. uh, dismissed this and saying it lacked merit. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, you, you know, so is it possible then for us to just, while we wait for mm -hmm. the reasons that will be given for this, because yes. a lot of lawyers have said that the process 
there is absolutely nothing wrong with the process. You have said that, you know, there is, mm. this is coming, you have not seen this happening in any other Commonwealth country. Mm. Uh, but they have said that each court decides how it wants to give its own judgment. If there is nothing wrong with this, I mean, at least according to those who should know, yeah. why should we raise an eyebrow? <laughs> God help us if the whole machinery of justice is decided only by male lawyers. That would be a very dangerous thing for a democracy. Uh, your system of justice should be so, so transparent that even a child will know that justice is being done and will see that justice is being done. The fact that lawyers approve one thing or the other does not necessarily make. If I don't forget that lawyers are not really about justice; they are about the law and how to win at every opportunity. That's that's what it is. But we, as as public intellectuals, as philosophers, uh, uh, have an intellectual obligation to judge the judges. Hmm. But but how do you respond to? some members of society who will say, look, they've never really seen in the history of this country when a presidential election or petition tribunal upturns a judgment in the opposite direction. So they just thought, as a result of that precedence, they just thought, well, they didn't expect any of those. Members of society actually feel that way. The members of society? Yeah, some people, uh, a lot of people, uh, when, uh, which apart from Kenya, which in recent which history. Which survey did you carry out to make such uh, uh, sweeping no, generalization? That is histor a historical fact. Have we ever seen it in recent democratic experience? The Supreme okay. Court upturned judgment? We've never seen it. So they, when they cite that, they have a point, don't they? Because something has been happening, therefore, it has to be that way. I don't think that is... <laughs> good what, what do you think when lawyers, think we've, we've had SAMs here who will tell you, well, you people keep talking about judiciary in this manner, but don't yeah. forget they are a reflection of society. So they tell us that. Very true. How does that sit no, no, with you? You are right, Champlain. They, 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 are, they don't live in Mars or Jupiter. They live in society and, you know, the, the, uh, their prejudices uh, and biases. Uh, sometimes shaped by that, you know. So I agree. I mean, in fairness, I agree. Uh, but in the current atmosphere in which we are, I am very concerned. You see, because if all those manipulations didn't take place, the removal of justice on again, in ways that I, I, I don't know the details of the merit of the case. Uh, he owned some properties here. He owned one or two million dollars. Look, if you've been a very senior lawyer for many years, and you were in the Supreme Court, even your allowances alone, if you didn't have that number of houses, he, he would be a, a compound fool. You know, unless he's an idiot. You, you invest, even taking federal mortgage loan, you can build more houses than on again had. So what are we talking about? But there was a lot of manipulation. Just even see with an amount of money was uh, he, he was he was convicted even before he the, the matter was looked at his merit. He had to go, and then there was this manipulations just two weeks ago to bring in a new set of judges. Now that 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 worries me a lot. Okay, so you, that you, worries me a you, lot. You, you question the quality of justices that we have now, yeah, and have even the quality of the judges. Many of them are not competent, they're not qualified. Okay, so, and you have also cited some that you consider iconic down through history. Yes. What did we have then that we have lost now, and how do we bring it back so that we can continue to have the quality justices and judges and yeah. judgments yes. that you think will help us develop? You know, there was the great uh, Justice Mohammed Bello. He was like a father to me. You know, after he retired as Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice, he was the chairman of the African Development Bank Tribunal, where I used to, I used to work, uh, the African Development Bank. So I met him very often, look. And I was in a position to assess the quality of people like that. Or, for example, Justice Kutigi, who died uh, just a few months ago. These were very serious people. These were highly competent people. 
even General Abacha, when he took over, he just drove to his house one day, I'm told, to see him. And uh, he was told that uh, the head of state has come to see you. He opened his window and told General Abacha to get out of his house. I didn't invite you. Get out and get lost. I'm the Chief Justice of Nigeria, and you cannot come to my house just any time and anyhow you like. These are men of honor and men of principle. Not the kind of things we are seeing these days. So what should we, how do we bring back that? Look, let's, let's, let's have, I, I just ask you to just Google the Supreme Court of Singapore. Look at the quality of people there. Get only people of the highest quality into the Supreme Court. That's number one. Number two, the taxi, the, the taxi, taxi rank rule that says the day you come in gives you seniority. It's only in Nigeria we practice that. It is shortchanging us. Number one, it is very costly because they are, you, over the last five years, we have had something like seven chief justices. No, no, four or five. It's like some of them, you know, they are there for six months or one year, and then they are due to retire. Now, it is very costly for the treasury, and it is giving us incompetent people. Yeah. Look, you, you're making the same point that uh, Mr. Sage made. Who? Uh, Mr. Aisha Sage, special advisor to the president on Presidential Advisory Council on Corruption or something yes, like that. Yes, okay. He made the same point when Justice Walter Onogin was removed or was under trial mm -hmm. at CJN. He said, and people criticized him for it, that we shouldn't operate this seniority uh, yes. method. That it, it just means that whether or not the person is or has the requisite qualification or can actually lead the judiciary. Uh, we, we, we put the person there mm -hmm. only and simply because the person is the most senior. But it is very wrong. I don't know about Professor Saige. It's a Saige's opinion. I don't know. I never heard about it. But that has been my, my view, and I've written about the judiciary uh, uh, in some of my columns. Yes. And I believe it is very, very wrong. It is not in our statutes. It's not in our constitution. Mm -hmm. It is, and the Supreme Court is not civil service where you operate on the basis of seniority. Nonetheless, what, well, let me tell you what they do in Singapore. What they do in Singapore is like the papal conclave, that all of you, as very senior judges, uh, you don't elect yourself, but you, you do a secret ballot in which you say, you write the name of whoever you believe, apart from yourself, is the most competent to head the, up, the, the highest court. And all of them do it, and what they do is that they collect and find out whoever comes top. And most of the time, it doesn't make a mistake. So mm. we are shortchanging ourselves, we are shortchanging the treasury by turning the Supreme Court into a civil service. It is a very uh, fraudulent process, very fraudulent. Now, why would we say that? Can, can, them can, up. We, can we so, really... Excuse me, the idea of lining them up yeah. so that everyone has his turn and have a bite and so on and so forth. And then you have people spending one year and, two, and the retired Supreme Court judges and all that. I, I, I think it is fraudulent, it is not in our constitution, and we should get rid of it. Unfortunately, we, it can only work best when you have a merit-based society, a society that recognizes merit, even among peers at that level. They know who is who. They know who is who. Just like just, uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Taslim Olawale Elias was removed by the military who humiliated him. The next thing is the world court asked for him and he went there as a, as a judge of the world court at The Hague and within a short time he became the president of the world court. The first African to ever occupy such a position and, uh, and I think the last African to have ever occupied this, this, such a position so far. So, you know, you, you, the, the whole world knew that he was a man of outstanding merit. These are the kind of people 
uh, that we should have well, in the yeah. Supreme Court. And, and there are many senior lawyers but who are extremely but, 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 uh, the, the thing about all of this is that uh, yes. even in some of these countries, in Western countries, uh, they've mm -hmm. had judgments given that people have actually protested. Of course. Saying that, no, they don't agree with this kind yes, of thing. Yes, of course. But over here, they always, we should also factor in when they say, look, yes, the court of public opinion doesn't necessarily determine what happens in the courts. You yes. have to present your case. Should, exactly. the, the courts are not Father Christmas. Exactly. They don't give what you don't ask. So yeah. you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. So yes. if they don't prove it, no matter what the public think, yes. the judges can't do their hands exactly. are tied. Exactly. But let's be careful in all this. To be honest with you, even if <laughs> you don't believe in democracy, you don't believe in anything. You're just there to, to occupy power and do what you want. Fair enough. But the most dangerous thing for any ruler is to tamper with the temple of justice. Because once you do that, you destroy the whole political system and the whole system of justice and the rule of law. Even the Chinese with their 3,000 years of statehood and civilization, and they are not what you would call democrats. Let's, but let's, they understand that they have to keep the rule of law. Yeah, uh, I'm speaking about tampering with things, because yes. some members of Labour mm -hmm. actually think that the governors are tampering or attempting to tamper <laughs> with the agreements that they had concerning the minimum wage. Yes. Because the governors, after they had their meetings, just said, well, uh, yes, you've had all that agreement with the negotiation about the minimum wage yes. and consequential uh, adjustments, which mm -hmm. they, yeah, they agree with. Sure. But the states will pay according to their capacity. All mm -hmm. of the previous negotiations notwithstanding, or according to what they agree mm -hmm. with the workers in the state. So some members of Labour think, this is the first way what mm. had been agreed upon. Sure. Do you think that you see crisis a lot ahead? Well, I think crisis is a strong word. Um, Fayemi, uh, Governor Fayemi, who is the, the chair of the Governor's Forum, has said that they don't have a problem paying, but they want uh, accounting reconciliation between what the federal government purportedly owes them and what they owe the government. So they need to do that accounting reconciliation and then they will pay. But it's, it's a big concern for me uh, at a slightly different level that most of our states from the point of view of public finances. They're like black holes. You know, the late Stephen Hawking, the physicist, who described black holes as these huge, monstrous stars that operate uh, against the laws of gravity and they suck in everything within their, their reach and nothing goes out. That is really what some of the states are. They are black holes, literally, from a financial point of view. All the money goes in. You don't know what goes out. They're building estates up and down. You know, even Louis XIV would have felt jealous of those people. And they've hijacked the local governments. And, by the way, nobody ever gives a balance sheet or a financial statement at the end of the year. I think Kano tried to do that under Gandola. Uh, 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 and so on, but I doubt those figures. The central bank has a big duty because one of its primary mandates is to be an advisor to the government. It doesn't say only federal government. So they have a duty really to work with the state governments to sort out a lot of their public finances. Uh, uh, and uh, if people are collecting money from federal government, and I, I read some of those conditions. They were conditionalities. They were not just come and take money and go. No, no, no. The bailouts had conditionalities. Yeah. What they had to do in order to be beneficiaries, they had to undertake to do that. And, and I think that they've forgotten that. The federal government should insist on that. But having said that, um, a, a negotiated approach is the best thing. 
and the federal government through federal minister of finance should work with the states uh, you know to do the deductions in a way that it's not too disruptive for everybody. But in principle, you know, if you borrow, you pay back, obviously. Well, do you uh, think that the states have that black hole, uh, operate that black hole principle, but they in turn think otherwise? They, as a matter of fact, remember when some of them tried to reduce the size of the civil service so that they can accommodate, so, so that it won't just be after paying salaries, you're left to little or nothing. Mm -hmm. So they tried to do that. So can't we, are we painting all of them with one brush? Because I don't know which, who will preside mm. over no, no, something that you can provide mm. any meaningful development in your state. No, no, obviously I, I wouldn't paint all of them with, with uh, one brush, you know. Uh, they're not necessarily all of them black holes in the same level. Uh, some are doing reasonably well. Um, some are doing quite well uh, in terms of infrastructures development and the rest of it. And I agree that, uh, you know, in Kaduna State, uh, you know, uh, Governor El Rufai, you know, had a whole exercise of screening civil servants and he saved billions of Naira from doing that because there were so many ghost workers, thousands of ghost workers who were on full salary. And I think that should be done continually, every year, in order to, to weed out people who are ghost workers. I think things like but they other also states can adopt that template yes. and do the same. Exactly. They need to do that. But you see, the governors also create a lot of these problems. You become a governor, you bring all your village people to become advisors with no offices. And it's a way of, you know, jobs for the boys, as it were. And, uh, and then when they leave, they are there. A lot of them are there. Or you just simply put them in the civil service. Uh, uh, and you see, it, we should learn something from India. India has what they call the All India Administrative Service, where all entry is by very serious competitive examination. So if you are from Lagos State, you, you have to go through, sit the exams, uh, they may eventually post you to your state, uh, uh, and so on. So it, the whole system is centralized. We're not saying that Lagos State or Kano State will be shortchanged, but they, they have to, your civil servants must meet the national minimum conditions of, of qualification for entry. And that works very well in India. And I think we need to copy that model. Instead of simply uh, people, governors, dishing out jobs and so on and so forth. There are cases I know where, you know, somebody meets somebody somewhere, say, oh, come, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a director, you know, and, and so on. And it, I've seen lots of such things. Yeah. And we've destroyed the civil service, we've put in dead wood, and then we have to pay them up to pensionable age. And that is but, a but, drug. But now that we're implementing this IPPIS, mm -hmm. that's going to take us in leaps and bounds compared to where we're coming from. Yes, indeed, it can, but you can. It does not eliminate ghost workers because ghost workers can still be smuggled into the IPPS. You know, oh. with uh, their biometrics. Sorry. Biometrics. With, with the biometrics. Mm. Okay. Well, if the biometrics does does work effectively, then it will be a little bit more difficult. But the problem also is that you can have people being recruited illegally. They are recruited illegally. Uh, the basis of their recruitment is wrong, but they are smuggled into the system. They will do all their biometrics and so on and so forth, and they'll collect their salaries. Hmm. But how do you see them, or how do we address this? Because if, if the states have said, uh, I mean, people think they're right on that, saying, look, it's a federal system. Yes. The federal government cannot negotiate and tell the states what they have to pay, even though Labour thinks, well, no, that's what it has to be, because if they don't do that, yes. they will bastardize the whole system and mm. pay pittance to mm. a lot of people, whereas they should not be doing all of those. Yes. But the states have actually said, look, yes, you have all of those. Yes, sure. there will be consequential adjustments, but sure. we will pay mm -hmm. from what we can. We sure. can pay what we don't have. Do we agree mm -hmm. to pay, for instance, 30000 now when we can, can't actually pay that? Where does that leave them? I think they are being too clever by half, as the English would say. How is that? Uh, because they were part of the discussions at the National Executive, at the National Economic Council. They were part of the discussions. 
They cannot now turn around and say, ah, no, 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 this thing is a federal thing, you can't force it or not. No, no, no. There are certain cross-party, bipartisan, national issues that are dealt with at the level of the National Council of States, chaired by the Vice President under our Constitution. And a lot of these issues are subject to those discussions before a final decision is made. And let's just be fair. I mean, 30,000 is the most minimum. It's not even a living wage. A lot of people, that's what they spend on fueling their cars per month. You know, and this is what we're saying should be the pay of our workers, and we are complaining about it. So, so how much does a governor spend even just fueling his cars? I mean, let's be fair. Uh, we are being unjust. Uh, with, with the monthly matter. wage bill, as uh, you know, enumerated in the consequential adjustment that we just saw on the screen yes. you know, a little while ago, <laughs> some states, well, some people have also argued that there are states that are not able to even sustain themselves. Some of those sta some states, some say that mm -hmm. some states are not viable on their own. Mm. And consequently, which is the reason why some of them couldn't even pay yes. the 18,000 Naira minimum wage at the time. And now they have to come up to uh, such that they had to be bailed out, so to speak, mm. by the federal sure. government. So how do you respond to that fact, to, to that uh, belief in some quarters that some of these states are not of their own selves viable? Well, at some stage they were viable, they were reasonably viable, uh, but now some of them have made themselves unviable How? by massive recruitment of unqualified people into the cival service. Uh, by Just recent or previously, because now a lot of no, them are every, trying to every, cut down. Every governor comes and then does his own. Uh, another governor comes and does his own. By the time that happens, you have thousands of people. I've traveled to some of the states, and I do so quite often. You find a lot of civil servants that don't even come to work. Some don't even have an office. Many of them, there was one guy who had something like, uh, what is it, uh, 200 advisors. They had no offices. And then, uh, and then they're on the payroll. You well, know, so that 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 that's that a public service. That's public service that differentiation is public service. from yes. from the core civil service. But all of them collect money from the from the payroll. Uh, so, but there may be a one or two, three, four states that you could say, from a purely technical point of view, uh, there's a huge difficulty. Some of them, IGR, uh, Yobe, Zamfara. Uh, the capital of Dutse, the, what's the capital of uh, Dutse is food state. Uh, some of those kind of states uh, have serious financial difficulties. They don't even have IGR yeah, to speak of. So without federal government handout, they won't survive. And, and how so, do we address this? You know, uh, because if, if this is not addressed, mm -hmm. all of those agreements sure. be from grade level 6 to mm -hmm. 17 yes. or 19, yes. whichever one you will, will always come up uh, sure. about their capacity to pay. Because sure. I, I do remember some time ago, the NGF, they were talking about doing something about either uh, renegotiating the revenue mobilization, how much mm -hmm. the center gets, how much you go to the states, yeah. uh, the resources that are in the states, what do they do about that law? So. Is it about time that we actually look at them from, with respect to solving this problem on a long-term basis? Well, in India, they practice what they call cooperative federalism, that some states can come together and pool a lot of their resources together to build joint, uh, develop joint infrastructure projects and so on and so forth and also cooperate with the federal government in a whole host of areas. Look at, for example, Nasarawa State. Uh, the boundary between the federal capital and, and, uh, and Nasarawa State is at Nyanya. Anything after Kauru and uh, Maraba everywhere is Nasarawa State. Uh, I don't see why Nasarawa State cannot cooperate with the FCT 
uh, in so many areas because in reality, many of the people who work in uh, the federal capital reside in those areas. But Just like how do they do that to ensure that they also boost their IGR? They should work together to develop the infrastructures of these areas. Federal FCT should say, okay, look, you know, we have a vested interest in, you know, the convenience of people traveling to, to work here. Uh, you are our neighbors. So let's work together, develop the roads, develop basic infrastructures, develop things that will benefit everybody, and so on and so forth. And of course, Nasrallah State uh, should do that because, you know, when uh, it's a flourishing environment, they can collect more taxes mm -hmm. and it's a win-win for everybody but I, I don't see them doing that i told one of asked one of the governors why are you not doing that he said ah because they didn't vote for me so I, it's none of my business i don't care about them and i say your excellency but can't you look at it the other way around that if last time they didn't vote for you if you did something for these people don't you think next time they will vote for you uh, of course, politicians are not that long term. We see more collaboration, though. I mean, we see states yeah. coming together, perhaps regionally. Yes. Uh, Southeast Governors Forum, mm -hmm. the Southwest Governors, there's a dawn, I think, yes. uh, in yeah. the Southwest. Uh, we even have the Northern Governors Forum, powerful groups, you will see. Uh, this is our sides, the Nigerian Governors Forum. Uh, they have all of these forums, it would seem to aid cooperation. However, we're yet to really see it trickle down, uh, you know, to development, to, to come to concrete on, you know, what do you think could be hindering them? Could that mm. be uh, m maybe, I don't know, mm. what do you see could be hindering them in such a way that we have? We've had great plans. For instance, mm. in the Southwest, we've, we've heard that they want to buy vehicles to cooperate on security, or mm -hmm. they're looking to build a rail line that will crisscross the whole of the Southwest region mm. and service that particular area. But when it comes to the concrete, we're yet to see it. We're still having discussions on minimum wage. Yes. In fact, there's been more progress in cooperation in the, south, in the southwestern states. Uh, because I met, I was in Ibadan the other day. There's actually a commission for economic planning, regional economic planning for the whole western states. And I was very impressed uh, with what they're doing. And uh, yes, they are cooperating in those areas and so on and so forth, which is excellent. And I welcome that. But again, we have this problem of fiefdoms. Everybody jealously guards their fiefdom and their territory. Uh, they're the lords of the manor, don't forget. Uh, our, our, our governors are the most powerful state governors I know anywhere, uh, in the sense that they can corner the whole resources of the state. Nobody's going to ask them, except if EFCC down the road when they would have lost their immunity. Uh, they can corner the local government funds. They can pocket the judiciary. They can pocket the civil service. Everybody's at their beck and call. Uh, and that is where the problem is. But even in the southwestern states, part of the problems Lagos is having is because they are not cooperating enough in certain areas. Uh, a lot of people live in Ogun and work in Lagos, and uh, issues of taxation and the rest of it have come up. And, and then the states, the contiguous states, are very jealous of their territory. And they've made it very difficult for Lagos to expand outwards. I'm told that problem existed since the times of Obafemi Awolowo, but it's still an issue. Uh, and because of that, there's so much overcrowding in Lagos. And we expect Lagos to become a mega city of 21 million by the year, in 30 years' time by the year 2050. How on earth are they going to cope with that situation? So, yes, cooperation is imperative. I would love a situation where, in fact, some states can constitutionally decide to group themselves together and become one And region. merge, right? Sorry? <laughs> and merge. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So that they can be viable on their own. Yes. No, well, they, 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 sorry. Um, we need to go. <laughs> just a tiny one. Um, Lagos really doesn't, well, some would say Lagos doesn't have any mineral resources of its own, so to speak. Sure, sure. But somehow Lagos generates quite a huge amount of uh, uh, IGR and all sure, of that. Sure. Uh, 
isn't it possible to replicate the same thing in all of the other states? For instance, some would also <laughs> argue that Dubai has had nothing yes. but had to create some value. Yes. Is there a way that the different states that are supposedly not viable now can create value of their own, that can make them um, viable on their own? Well, of course, we need to do that. But you see, without peace, nothing can happen. Without peace, there cannot be development. You cannot build SMEs. You cannot build factories. You cannot build industries. You cannot build businesses. And therefore, you will have nobody to tax. But let's not over, overdo the issue of Lagos. I've always reminded very gently my Isaleko friends that Lagos is Lagos only because it has a vast interior to which it is supplying so much. Uh, a lot comes through a papa and the rest of it, uh, uh, right through to even Niger, Chad, and Central African Republic. And so Lagos uh, is a hub of business only because there is a vast interior that it, it services. All right. So let's have that in proportion. Even though now they talk about oil in the states, which is adding to more of those yes. resources. And by the way, even in the north, <laughs> they've, they've discovered oil now, which well, is... Okay, uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. Uh, we'll keep getting all of those things, but we're hoping that it <laughs> yes. will trickle down, because that's the yes. big thing that people really want to see. But thank you very much indeed for coming on this morning, Dr. Obadiah Malafa. Thank you. We're back in a moment. Don't go away.